Good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to the Department of Psychiatry Grand Rounds today. I am Yates Conwell, Vice Chair of the Department and um, Co-Chief, uh, Academic Chief with Anton Thorstensen of the Geriatric Mental Health and Memory Care Program. Um, <clears throat> I'm really pleased today to introduce a, an old friend of the department and of many of us here, Dr. Uh, Daniel Jimenez, who's going to be telling us about um, uh, his work, uh, supported by extramural funding from the National Institute of Health. And the title of his talk today is Reimagining Mental Illness Prevention Through Health Promotion, the vision of the OLA program. And OLA stands for Happy Older Latinos Are Active. Uh, before getting into that, though, I have some housekeeping I want to remind you of. First of all, microphones and cameras are off, um, and um, except for presenters and, and uh, interpreters. We do, however, very much want your input here as we go along. Please uh, think of questions and comments and put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen rather than the chat box, because we use chat uh, for interpreters and uh, technical issues. Uh, we will get to questions at the end. And Dr. Jimenez will reserve time for that. Uh, so um, at that time, uh, we will go through all the questions that we can. Uh, and so please uh, feel free to put them in at any time and, and we will get through them. Also, um, there will be other opportunities to provide feedback about the Grand Rounds today, which we very much rely on for our ongoing efforts to make these valuable for you. There are three ways to do that. You'll notice um, a link to the evaluation form uh, in the chat window towards the end of the program, so keep your eye out for that. Um, there will also be a link at the end of the presentation to uh, the evaluation form. And then for those who have registered um, online, there will be a, uh, an email sent out with the link to the evaluation program uh, form in the next day or so. Uh, and anybody who uh, has spent 45 or more total minutes uh, in the Zoom session here and who has filled out the evaluation form will be eligible for continuing education credit. So at this point, <clears throat> let me switch back to talking about why we're here today uh, and introduce our speaker, Dr. Daniel or Danny Jimenez, whom I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with for many years through our shared interest in older adult mental health. Dr. Jimenez is also a collaborator and consultant with a couple other members of our department, Drs. Caroline Silva and, and Kim Van Orden, and he's been an outstanding resource for us. Dr. Jimenez uh, received his doctoral degree in uh, clinical psychology, <clears throat> excuse me, from Pacific Graduate School of Psychology, and then uh, followed that with a stint as a research associate at Dartmouth, and then moved to Florida as a member of the faculty at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, where he is now associate professor of psychiatry and of public health sciences. Dr. Jimenez has, uh, has emerged as a leading voice for Latino mental health with a particular focus on older adults and the consideration of cultural factors in the recognition, treatment, and prevention of common mental disorders in that population. Uh, he's a prolific scholar with uh, almost 50 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters and monographs and numerous extramurally funded research grants from several different institutes of the NIH. Uh, including the program of research funded by the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities uh, that uh, will, that um, was the source of some of what he will tell us about today. His studies are rigorous, uh, inventive, and impactful uh, given the large and growing segment of the older adult population that is Hispanic and the burden of mental and physical health comorbidities that they carry. He's also generous with his knowledge and experience and, and a real delight to work with. Uh, before I hand it over to Danny, let me just read a bit from an interview that I pulled from the web uh, about Dr. Jimenez to give you a sense of, of who he is. Dr. Jimenez is the son of parents who emigrated from Cuba, hoping to make a new and better life for themselves and their children. He identifies himself as Cuban. 
From that vantage point, Dr. Jimenez grew up not only witnessing the hardship of being an immigrant, but also watched as they persevered in the face of great uh, adversity. He learned from an early age that despite older generations carrying great wisdom and knowledge, a foreign culture that marginalizes minorities can severely challenge even the most capable of immigrants. These early experiences ignited Dr. Jimenez's passion and continued to drive his commitment towards helping older racial ethnic minority adults. So with that background, uh, welcome to Rochester, Danny, from your uh, seat there in sunny Miami. Well, thanks, uh, thanks Yates. Thank you for that wonderful uh, uh, intro. Um, I am delighted to be uh, presenting here uh, from uh, hold on one second. Sorry, there. Uh, I'm I am delighted to be presenting. I wish I was in person, uh, but I will take the balm eighty three degrees here in Miami. Um, although I don't know what it's like in uh, Rochester at the moment, I don't think it's uh, quite sunny and eighty three as it is here. But uh, nevertheless, I am delighted to be here. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me, and I am really looking forward to telling you about my project, the, which is really my passion project, uh, which is OLA, the Happy Older Latinos Are Active. And before we get started, I just want to make sure, I just want to disclose that I have no relevant commercial relationships uh, to disclose. Um, although uh, my kids would say that uh, my work does conflict with their interests because um, I, they would say that I spend too much time at work um, so, and even though I try to try to make it as egalitarian as possible, they would uh, nevertheless disagree. Um, so I just want to give you a quick overview as to where or what we're going to be doing or what I'm going to be talking about today. And um, I want to start off with a quick review of the Hispanic or Latino population. And we're going to talk about some exciting facts. I don't know if any of you like puns. I love puns. Uh, I do not see any pun that is bad. Um, then we're going to move on from those exciting facts to disparities and the reasons why I believe these disparities exist. And um, we're going to talk about what to do about the disparities. How are we going to address them, uh, particularly OLA, and then the implications surrounding this work. Um, I do want to highlight, before I even get started, I do want to highlight the work of Natalie Ferris, Prieta Fontan, Gabby Cabezas, uh, Elizabeth Soriano, and Doris Perdomo Johnson, who have been the shoulders, who have been the giants on, on, uh, on whose shoulders I stand. Um, and it's without them, I would not be able to do any of the work that, I've been, that I have done. And so I want to start off by talking about Hispanic or Latino. We talk about both, and usually they are interchangeable. And as the, if they're, is there a difference? In all honesty, I don't know. It's a question for an anthropologist. My personal experience is a matter of geography. Um, growing up here in Miami, we used the term Hispanic. When I moved to California to go to graduate school, um, the term, we used the term Latino. When I moved to Texas, there was the term Latino. When I moved to, uh, when I moved to Boston, there was, it was a mixture. So I think it's more of a matter of geography. Uh, that's my personal experience, but um, nevertheless, um, uh, they're, they, the, the two terms are used interchangeably. But for consistency's sake, um, and because my project is, uh, uses the word Latino, I'm going to use Latino throughout, the, uh, throughout the, the presentation today. And so who are the Latinos? And so the Latinos are defined as uh, an ethnic minority comprised of individuals of Cuban, Dominican, Mexican, Puerto Rican, uh, Central and South American, or other Spanish culture, regardless of race. Um, they encompass about 60 and a half million people living in the United States, which is roughly about 18 and a half percent of the population. Um, the definition is problematic um, because it, it, it attempts to encompass individuals from the non-Spanish speaking countries of Central and South America, such as uh, Belize or Brazil. Um, but most of these individuals do not identify as Latinos. Um, and so for the purposes of the presentation today, when I use the term Latino, I'm going to refer strictly to individuals from the Spanish speaking countries of Central and South America. 
as well as the Caribbean. Um, and so who are these folks? Um, we've defined them, but what do they actually look like? And as you can see, 64% uh, around there um, are of Mexican descent. Um, this, and Mexicans comprise the largest uh, sub-ethnic uh, uh, Latino group. Um, next up are the Puerto Ricans or at 9%. At no Salvadorians uh, and Cubans are at 4%. And then um, Guatemalans, Dominicans, and the rest of the Colombians and Venezuelans and the rest of Central and South America make up the rest. Um, I do like to point out that Miami is not like the rest of the country. 66% um, of the population here and the, uh, uh, the, of the Latino population here in, in Miami is actually Cuban. So we're sort of almost an inverse and we have very few uh, Latinos of Mexican descent. And so as you can see, Latinos are not a homogeneous or monolithic group. Um, each Latino subgroup has their own unique cultural heritage. Some are more influenced by the, the, the natives that were there when the Spanish arrived. Some are influenced the, uh, through African, uh, through the African slave trade, and some such as Uruguay and, um, and Argentina are more influenced through European, uh, mainly uh, Italian and German. Um, and so each, each Latino subgroup faces their own unique difficulties, such as economic assimilation, dual identity, uh, legality of their immigration. But that being said, there are many shared cultural characteristics, such as language, feminism, religiosity, cultural values of that sort that tie us all together. And so when possible, when I'm, when I'm talking about uh, Latinos, I will try to disaggregate, but mostly I will be lumping everyone together. Um, a lot of the national samples that look at Latino uh, mental health lump everyone together without this aggregation, um, mainly because there's not a lot of power to detect a lot of differences when you start breaking them up. And so in aggregate, Latino adults that are 18 and above are at lower risk of most psychiatric disorders compared to their non-Latino white counterparts. However, a much more complicated picture emerges when you take into it, when you take into account age and some ethnicity. And so the lifetime prevalence um, for Latinos, but for older Latinos, 60 and above, is around 16.4% compared to 12.2% in non-Latino whites. The lifetime prevalence of anxiety disorders is around 15% for Latinos compared to 13.5% for non-Latino whites. And then when you look at 12 month prevalence, what we see is we see, we're starting to see uh, even starker differences where a uh, 12 month prevalence of depressive disorders is about 8% uh, compared to 3.2% non-Latino whites. And then uh, for the 12 month prevalence of anxiety disorders, looking at 9.4% compared to 8.4% in non-Latino whites. And so when we break it down, what we see is that yes, there's this lifetime prevalence of 16.4% uh, overall, but when we break it down, what we see is there are very stark differences within this ethnicity. So Puerto Ricans have a, uh, have a much higher prevalence, uh, uh, lifetime prevalence of this depressive disorders uh, compared to Cubans and compared to Mexicans, but Cubans are in the middle around 14.8% and Mexicans in the middle. And so that, and data on anxiety disaggregated by group is less prevalent, no pun intended there, but however, the studies on younger adults do show a similar pattern uh, as we're seeing here. And so the country of origin alone doesn't confer risk or protection from psychiatric illness. Rather, it's more of a complex combination of family, contextual, and social status factors associated with nativity and age of arrival in the US that can protect or put older Latinos at risk. And I can go on and on about this and I could actually, I can actually talk for the rest of the hour talking about individual, uh, about these individual issues, you know, such as, uh, you know, the breaking up of the family due to migration, contextual factors such as uh, immigration, uh, citizen stat citizenship status, um, social status, whereas like Cubans are, uh, like Cubans are mainly concentrated here in Miami. Um, and so don't face the same sort of discrimination that other uh, so that, uh, Latino groups face. And then, um, but um, we will save that perhaps for another day. 
Um, so, you know, we've established that, okay, there is a clear need for older Latinos to seek services. However, despite the need, older Latinos are not seeking mental health services at the same rate as their non-Latino white counterparts. So less than a quarter of, the, of older Latinos who are in need of mental health care actually engage in mental health care compared to 35% uh, of older non-Latino whites who, um, who need care and actually do uh, um, initiate care. Now, that 35% is by no means good, but 24% is a lot worse. And so that's why, um, uh, that's part of the reason why I, I, I'm focusing on older Latinos. And there are numerous access barriers. There, there are language barriers. Um, a lot of Latinos speak Spanish or, and are monolingual Spanish. Um, the majority of uh, the majority of mental health practitioners and providers are do not speak Spanish. Um, so there is a clear barrier uh, with that. Income and lack of insurance also play a huge role in the ability to access these services. However, these differences still persist even when access is similar across ethnic groups. And so, and what we're also finding is that when mental health services are actually accessed, older Latinos tend to drop out earlier and they also tend to receive low quality or inadequate treatment. And so why, the, why do these disparities exist? Um, and just in case you weren't able to tell, those are my kids um, who have uh, unwillingly or unwittingly, I should say, signed up to be part of this presentation. Um, so why do these disparities exist? Um, well, it's, a, it's been my experience both uh, research-wise and also as a clinician that the available treatments that we have do not necessarily match the Latino's experience. Um, I've done qualitative studies that when I've, speak, when I've spoken to Latino, uh, old, specifically older Latinos, and I asked them about, you know, about their depressive symptoms or about their experiences with uh, depression or anxiety, they talk about their physiological symptoms. They talk about like, I'm drowning. There's this heaviness in my chest. Um, they have, you know, this, this sort of back pain or, or GI issues. And so a lot of their symptoms are clustered around, that, around this. And then when you ask them about, you know, uh, or even feeling nervous, right? Because that you can, that's the, it's, a, it's still a, that's still a very physiological feeling. But when you ask them about their emotions and how they feel, it's, 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 it becomes less clear. And so it's not, it, it, it's like, I'm not sad, sad, but I just, you know, I just don't feel good. I don't feel right. There's this muscle tension. There's this heaviness in my chest. Um, I, can't, I have difficulties breathing. And so it becomes a lot more physiological and a lot less psychological almost. Um, we know that, um, that older Latinos, they have a different view of what causes mental illness. So in addition to, the, uh, that in addition to their symptoms, what they're ascribing their symptoms to or why they're feeling this way is different, right? They'll, they'll talk about, the loss of family and friends, uh, moving away from their home. So there's this, this disintegration of the social fabric that plays a role in this, right? If they hadn't moved away from, let's say, Mexico or Cuba, um, then they wouldn't be experiencing what they're, what, what they're experiencing now because they would have been surrounded by the people that they know, their friends, their family members, and you know, and, and that social fabric is integral in um, in in their mental health. And so, the migration, as you can see, clearly plays a critical role in the in influencing their beliefs. And so, um, there's a study by Hinton and Levkoff that showed that Latinos believe that dementia was a result of migrating to a new country. And I saw that um, as a research assistant um, back when I was in graduate school, and um, and I see it now in my research and in also in my clinic that you know the, the effect of the scattering of the family members on that on the family structure is traumatic and um, can play uh, can play a, or plays a very important role in either maintaining their mental health 
or in, uh, in negatively impacting your mental health, depending on what happens with that, uh, with, with the social relationships. And then also there's a very big stigma surrounding, uh, surrounding mental health, right? When we talk about, when we talk about depression, when we talk about anxiety, the first thing I hear is, oh, I'm not crazy. No soy loco. That's, that's, that's what I hear all the time. Well, I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. And, um, and so there, there is this negative connotation with saying that they actually, that they're actually depressed or that they're actually anxious. And so depression is seen as a sign of personal weakness. Um, because if you're not able to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, then, you know, what's wrong with you? And that, that means that you're, you're not, you're not this strong person. Um, and you need, and you need to just basically like shape up and, and, you know, get to work or, you know, do the things you need to do. And there's also shame and embarrassment, right? Because if you're not able to do that, right? If you're not able to pick yourself up by your bootstraps, if you're not able to get to work, then that's embarrassing. Um, and you're not, and you're not fulfilling your duty either as a, either as a, as a son or as a father, as a provider to the family. Um, and so you're not fulfilling that obligation, not fulfilling that responsibility. And so even acknowledging mental illness would disappoint the plant and would, would disappoint the family and place undue burden upon them. Um, and then there's also distrust of medications, right? Um, I hear a lot of people uh, when I, when I, when I talk to them in the clinic, I, I, I try to guide them to, to seek when necessary, or if I think that it, it would be helpful for them to, to, take, to have some medications or to at least to consult with a psychiatrist uh, about medication. And then I, I get a lot of pushback being like, well, I don't want the medication to be controlling, you know, my thoughts. I don't want them to controlling my brain. I don't, uh, I, I fear the addiction that comes with, uh, with medication. So um, there's a lot of distrust around that. And then there's also, to, there's also distrust about psychotherapy, right? Uh, uh, as well, there's a, there's a fear that, um, that there's almost a view of psychotherapy as a black box, right? You walk into this office and sit on the couch and what happens after that? You know, it's, a, it's sort of like way too ambiguous. And so um, there's a lot of, there's, there, there is a lot of stigma surrounding psychotherapy in addition to medications as well. And so, um, we did talk a lot, or I did talk a lot about, um, you know, all the problems that we're facing and they are many, um, but I do want to reinforce that the sky is not falling, that there, there is, there is, there are things that we can do and there, um, and there, uh, and one of the things, one of the tools at our disposal that are, um, that are, that can be quite effective is health promotion. And when I talk about health promotion, I'm talking about activities that maintain or improve well-being. This could be getting adequate nutrition. This could be talk, uh, this could be uh, engaging exercise. Um, this could be um, um, this could be uh, improving sleep. So uh, so health promotion really captures uh, a wide variety of behaviors that uh, that can be done, and that we know that not only have an impact on their physical health, but we know has an impact on, uh, on their mental health. And so there's good, there's good data to show that engaging in these health promotion activities um, reduce vulnerability factors such as re reducing depression, anxiety symptoms, it improves physical functioning, improves sleep, um, improves psychosocial outcomes, whether that be uh, self-efficacy, or, or social support, depending if you're doing these uh, in groups or with other people. Um, it also improves biological markers that, that are indicative of uh, depression, anxiety, severity, such as uh, pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines. But what's also very interesting is that health promotion uh, activities can also address some of the physical health disparities that older Latinos are facing. So, Older Latinos um, are at high risk for diabetes and actually have a very high prevalence of diabetes. Similarly, they have very high rates of obesity, heart disease, and, uh, and they are uh, very, very highly sedentary. And so, well, what, 
what does a health promotion act, what does a health promotion intervention actually look like? And so that is what uh, ha the Happy Older Latinos Are Active or OLA is all about. Um, it's a health promotion, a multi-component health promotion intervention. And the, so what we've done is that the first component is what I call a social and physical activation session where this is where a promotora or a community health worker, um, they meet with one-on-one -on -one with, the, with the participant uh, for 30 minutes. And then they go over the ground rules of what's expected of them um, in terms of uh, you know, timing, because as, you're gonna, as I'm gonna talk to you, as you're gonna see, and, uh, it's, a, it's a very time intense and somewhat labor intense uh, intervention. So we really detail the study, even though we detailed that in the consent form, it's always good to have reinforcement, to reinforce what, we, what, what, what they're gonna be doing, to, for them to have a clear sense uh, of, what the, of, what is, of what is going to happen and what is gonna be expected of them. And then also in that session, we talk about, um, we talk about what we goal setting, not something that we keep track of, but just something for the, for the participants to say that they want to accomplish as being part of the study. And then, um, and then again, um, and then we finish off this session with problem solving. So the, the promotor engages the individual in problem solving to identify potential obstacles to engaging in uh, in, the, in, the, in the walking component, which I'll detail in a second, um, and then to come up with ideas as to how they, they can overcome that. And then um, the second component is a moderate intense walk that's done for 45 minutes, three times a week for 16 weeks. And the, uh, the walks are done in groups of six. Um, they start off with 10 minutes of stretching, then it's 25 minutes of, of, the, of the walk, and then it's uh, 10 minutes of stretching and cool down. And then, and, um, and these walks are done in a, in a park that is run and maintained by the county of Miami-Dade. And, the, um, and they are essentially located to where the participants are. Um, and then during that, during that cool down session or a, uh, part, of the, part of the walk, um, the promotora engages them in pleasant events scheduling. So the pleasant events are anything that the person, that the participant enjoys. It can be something active, such as going, dancing, doing Zumba, um, going out for walks. It could be, or it could be something very sedentary. It could be something, you know, like sitting, uh, like watching TV, uh, you know, talking on the telephone, um, you know, or something sort of in between like cooking. But the only rule that we have is that it has to be done by another person. It has to be done with another person. So if they're gonna be sitting and watching, let's say TV, a telenovela, um, then who are they gonna do it with? Is it gonna be with your partner? Is it gonna be with, uh, with one of your children, with a grandchild? Doesn't matter, it just has to be done with another person. And then what we do is that we do booster sessions to sort of reinforce after the 16 weeks are over, we do booster sessions twice a month um, to reinforce that, um, that uh, the, um, the, the goals done or the gains are, that have been made during the walk, during the, during the active component. And so uh, as part of my pilot K award, we compared Ola to a photonovela. And so photonovela is an educational booklet that uses pose photographs and simple text bubbles that actually looks like a comic book. And I'll show you a picture in a second. Um, and it portrays a very dramatic soap opera-like story to convey educational messages. And this has been done. Um, you, to, this has been done to promote health, cardiovascular health, uh, diabetes education, and also to combat stigma. And so we use popular images, cultural norms, simple text, dramatic stories, and vivid pictures to portray this story. Um, and so uh, the the most important thing was that why we use this as a control is because it was not activating. It was mainly to, uh, to give people something, some information uh, that they can use, um, but not that we're gonna engage them in something, something as active as OLA. And so this is basically what it looked like. Um, it, was, it was developed by uh, Leo Cabasa when he was, at the, he was at the University of South, South, uh, Southern California. Um, and as you can see, it's, um, 
it's not a very good picture, so I apologize. But um, as you can see, it kind of looks like a, uh, a comic book, but with the still photographs uh, that would you, you would see in, like, let's say, a telenovela. And then it's in, and then there's bits of Spanglish in there, like, hey, Joaquin, get the pasa, is something wrong? And so we pilot tested this um, with uh, 60 participants, age 60 and above. They had to self identify as Latino. They had to screen positive for PHQ 9 or the GAD 7, meaning they had to score above, uh, five or above on one of these measures. Um, they had to get medical clearance from their PCP. They uh, they could be how they were symptomatic, but they could not meet criteria for major depressive disorder or generalized anxiety disorder. Um, they could not have a history of uh, severe mental illness, such as bipolar or schizophrenia, and no substance abuse in the past 12 months, and not currently taking psychotropic medications. And so um, this is we as a pilot trial, we were not powered to detect differences. We were mainly looking at feasibility and acceptability. And feasibility, we um, defined it as 100% of targeted randomization um, for meeting that 100%, uh, meeting that target randomization of 60 uh, with 20% or less of eligible subjects refusing randomization. Um, retention being 85% completed post-intervention assessment and acceptability being 80% of the sessions attended by the other participants. Um, like I said, we were not powered to detect differences, um, although we were look, trying to see could we prevent incident or recurrent uh, episodes of major depressive disorder or generalized anxiety disorder. Um, and we also looked at reduction in symptom severity using the PHQ-9, the GAD-7, the QUIDS, and the BAI. And um, here I'm gonna present the data on two time points, post and, uh, pre and post intervention follow-up. Uh, so with an army of two, mainly it was really just one, Doris. Um, she recruited all 60 in one year, um, which was amazing considering the limited time and budget that a K affords. Um, and so this is what our sample looked like. 56% um, of the sample, or almost 57% of the sample was of Cuban descent. We were very proud of that fact, because like I said earlier, 66% of the Latinos in Miami are Cuban. Um, so a third came from South America, predominantly Colombia, but we had some from Chile, Peru, and Argentina. Um, we had just 3% from Central America, 3% from the Dominican Republic, and then 3% from the US. Uh, Puerto Rico. And so these are the demographics. Um, the, there were no, uh, no differences basically in age uh, or years of education, um, but there were differences in the years in the U.S. and that mainly had to do with the fact that those, uh, those two participants from the U.S. from Puerto Rico happened to, happened to randomize into Ola, and so that sort of skewed things in that direction. And so these are our results. Um, we, like I said, in 100%, uh, in, in a year, we met 100% of our target randomization. Um, we were able to retain uh, 56 of the 60 participants, so 93.3% of the, of the participants completed the post-intervention assessment. And so the four that did not, three came from the control and one came from, uh, from OLA. And the number of sessions attended um, was, uh, as you can see, there's a wide range from one to 48. And that one is because uh, uh, was because a, a person uh, in the OLA in one of the OLA groups actually ended up getting a job right after she started with the group, and then so she had to then stop, and so then uh, um, so she and then she she completed the post intervention follow up, but she stopped attending all the sessions, and then um, so if we remove her, then we, then we start seeing a little bit. Uh, an uptick in terms of the uh, number of sessions, the mean number of sessions attended, um, um, and but still the range is still quite large. And so when we look at again, we're not we weren't powered, but when we look at um, to see if we we were seeing any uh, any movement on depression or anxiety, what we found is that we didn't get a whole lot of movement overall with the on the on the quids, but we found some, we saw some movement um, between uh, baseline and post follow up. Uh, on, the, on the anxiety. But what's really, what I found to be really interesting was when we looked at, we looked at the data in depth, and when we looked at the proportion of participants who reported a clinically significant decrease in their symptoms, so 
we, um, we define clinically significant decrease being at one half the standard deviation of the scale score at baseline, what we're finding is for the BAI, we, we, we saw a, a difference in the proportion of participants in OLA compared to the photonovela who experiences clinically significant de uh, decrease. And we found a trend um, in the proportion of OLA uh, participants of OLA compared to the photonovela who experience a significant decrease in their depressive symptoms. And so, uh, so we took these, um, we took these, uh, these results and then we submitted, we submitted them, uh, we submitted the, as a, for an effectiveness grant to NIMHD. And while we were waiting for that, um, we, uh, that should say OLA HIV. I did another pilot study using funding uh, from the Center on Latino Health uh, Research Opportunities here at the University of Miami. Uh, and this, the Center for Latino Health Research Opportunities is CLARO, is funded through NIMHD and they had a pilot program. And so I applied and I got funded to evaluate the feasibility and acceptability of OLA among HIV infected older Latinos aged 50 and above who were at risk for developing cardiometabolic disease. So I, I, I took this uh, health promotion intervention and decided like, what if we changed it just a little bit in terms of meeting the needs of folks who have HIV or living with HIV? And can we, um, can we look, can we uh, look at and see if we can address this other very important uh, aspect of health, which is cardiometabolic disorders, which are very prevalent in older adults, in older Latinos, and specifically in older Latinos who are living with HIV. And so uh, as a, it was a pilot, um, just an N of 18, we were just looking at feasibility. Um, so and we're looking at age 50 and above in this, in this cohort, because uh, for folks that are that are living with HIV tend to age quicker. Um, biologically that is. And so they had to self-identify as Latino, they had to be virologically suppressed, um, and they had to have a documented risk of potential cardiometabolic disease uh, defined as having two of the following, either increased waist circumference, uh, low HDL, uh, high triglycerides, um, hypertension, or, um, or uh, high blood sugars. And so they were recruited through the Center for HIV uh, and Research in Mental Health database here at the University of Miami. And so these are the results of uh, age. They were 16, uh, they were about 16 and a half. Um, as you can see, the majority of them uh, or the plurality of them had a high, uh, some high school to, uh, to no formal education. So um, tend to be lower on, uh, on the um, education. Ethnicity, seven came from Cuba. Uh, Cuban descent, um, four from Colombia, three from Honduras, and then three from, uh, from the main, either the mainland or the, uh, the, it, two from the mainland, one from Puerto Rico, and then one from Nicaragua. Um, that spent about 30 years in the US. Um, most of them spoke Spanish, or, or all of them preferred Spanish. And uh, as you can see, there was uh, only a few of them were employed. And so, when COVID hit, all 18 participants had been enrolled. Uh, two groups had started, but one uh, group one had completed 14 of the 16 weeks. Group two had completed five of the 16 weeks. And group three had just formed, but they did not have the opportunity to meet in person, unfortunately. And so when COVID hit, we had to totally reshuffle because social distancing became part of the lexicon and an intervention that pro actually promotes social activation and being around other people is not the, was not the greatest thing to be doing at that time. Um, so we had to scramble. And so we switched everything to the phone. And, um, and so part of, that, part of that was that uh, participants were either not very tech savvy or had little to no access to up-to-date technology. A lot of them had flip phones. Actually, I think half of them actually had flip phones, and so when we switched everything, we were when we were debating on what you know, how can we do something like this? How can we can we be doing FaceTime while what the walks were going on, or you know what what could we do? And so when we landed on the phone, it was no, we were, 
the participants would call a conference line that we had already set up, and then they would call into this conference line and they would conference call with the community health worker. And then the community health worker would lead them on a walk through their neighborhoods, meaning the community health worker would be at home and each participant was in their own homes, but then they would go outside and then they would walk around the neighborhoods just as they would um, and in the park when they were all together. But in, in this case, they were doing it kind of by themselves, but kind of with other people. We were just trying to maintain personal connection. And so, and, we, and it was really important that the, that the community health worker, the promotora maintain that personal connection to keep that role as a motivator, to stay physically active, and also to be a, and also to be a bridge to the social world because the, these folks living with HIV at the time, you know, we 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 didn't know anything about COVID and how or what effect it would have. Um, but you know, these folks were you know uh, very isolated, um, and even more so because of their HIV status in a, in a COVID world, not knowing what that what that would look like. And so they became even more isolated. And so the community health worker became that bridge to the social world, to their outside world. And so for the results, in three months, we met our enrollment target um, with less than 5% of the eligible participants refusing to participate. Four participants were lost to follow up. And those four participants were from group three, the group that was formed but did not have a chance to meet in person. Uh, all 14 participants were eligible, who were eligible for the three month uh, post, uh, sorry. And we had two time, we had three time points. We had um, baseline, post intervention, and then three months post intervention. And then um, here, um, the all 14 participants who were eligible for the three month post intervention interview completed it. And participants attended about 77% of the sessions. Um, and the actual the attendance rate of the virtual walks was 94.6%. So there was this clear sort of wanting to stay part and connected to um, each other and the community health worker. And so these are the these are what the participants said in their own words. Um, so through their own words, we can, we saw that there was two general themes that came out. One was overcoming social isolation, loneliness, and stigma. The other group walks. Whereas the participants were saying, like, I can interact with other people. This is hard for me because I'm shy. Um, we've all become friends and know that we can count on each other. Um, what I like most about the program was meeting other people like me, walking with my group. They were all very friendly. And then there was also this connection with the community health worker. You know, the like one participant said, the CHW really listens to what I have to say. Another one talked about how she united them. Um, and how they, you know, and how they reached out to the group, and and th these are just illustrative, but the but almost all of them, almost all the participants, stated uh, something along these lines about overcoming social isolation and having a connection with the community health worker. And so, what are the lessons that I've learned in doing this work and doing OLA both uh, in pilot testing OLA in uh, in a mental health sample, in a purely mental health sample, and then OLA in a, an HIV sample um, more geared towards cardiometabolic disorders, but nevertheless with a mental health component in it. Um, and so what we found is that OLA is feasible and acceptable. And it's really important in the age of social distancing to not be, to, to, let, to let our participants know social distancing doesn't mean spiritual distancing. And that's not just now, um, because when, uh, when the first, it, and when the first uh, OLA project that I that I that I, that I did um, when the, when I when that ended, um, there was a there was a wanting to of the participants to stay connected to to the community health worker and sort of like well what what what's next for the project and how can I help and you know so so it's. So even though we can't be together, whether it's because of COVID or because the research has ended, it's really important to stay connected, to let them know that we are still with them spiritually, that, if, um, that, it, that it's still with them in spirit. So that if there is, if there's another project that comes along and they are available for it and they want to be a part of it, we'll, we will call them. And, um, and, 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 to, and it's really important to stay connected to them and, and how we, and, and what, and, and however way possible. 
um, because that personal connection means the world to the participants. And so once the, once the, once the project ends, to leave will, will give a sense of like, well, they just took my information and left, right? That we didn't leave them. So we don't wanna leave them feeling like they're like we left them high and dry. And so one of the things I didn't realize and uh, COVID really highlighted this was the technology divide is real. That I did not think that people had flip phones anymore, but they do. And, then, and we're not talking, and they're, they're not really burner phones. They're, they are phones that these folks use and it's, um, and it's, and it's their main source of, uh, of um, it's their main tether to the outside world. Um, and I've also learned that, well, the, like, to be able to convert some of this to be virtually, to be virtual is important, but it really, it's really important that there is this in-person component that, that, and no matter what you do that this virtual component is not going to replace the in-person components, it, it will complement it, but definitely not replace it. And obviously, um, COVID-19 is, is exacerbating social isolation and loneliness, ex especially amongst, uh, especially amongst folks that are have that were already experiencing to a large degree social isolation and isolation. Uh, uh, sorry, social isolation and loneliness, whether it's because of a mental illness or whether it's because of HIV that carries a lot of stigma. Um, you know, and but when COVID came along and it's still around, um, it's it it reinforced or exacerbated. Um, what these folks were experiencing and made things even worse for them. And so what are the implications? Um, the, so OLA can be used, it is an efficient use of scarce resources. So our time and mainly our, our money is very limited. And so if we can employ community health workers who, who are in the community, know the community, understand the community, can communicate with the community, can communicate with the community, not, not in terms of the language, right? I speak Spanish, I, Spanish was my first language. I still speak Spanish on a daily basis, but it's, it's in using the language that they understand. I, as an academic, I have learned that I, do, I no longer know how to talk to normal human beings. I accept that, but the community health workers understand and can be that bridge. They can, they can translate what we here in academia are doing and then bring it to the bring it out into the into the community, in a way, package it in a way that the community can understand and are willing to and can accept. Um, we can also combine prevention efforts, right? We can combine like health promotion, uh, like I said before, can help with not only the physical health, where right, if we're you know dealing with diabetes or cardiovascular disease, but also in the mental health realm as well. Um, I already talked about the the alternative the alternative service delivery model. There's only a ham, there, there there aren't very many of us in terms of uh, mental health providers, but there are a whole lot of community health workers who are willing to go into the community and um, and address these issues much more so than what than what we would be able to do um, one on one. And it, it it's not just for Latinos. It's it can be uh, whether this, it's the service model. Or, um, or, the, or, or the intervention itself, it's not just for Latinos, but it's use, it can be useful in engaging hard to reach or underserved populations um, because, uh, because it's less stigmatizing, it's very salient and um, it can be widely disseminated. And so moving forward, where are we right now? Luckily, I, uh, well, I'd like to say not luckily because I worked my tail off and, and I, got, I got funded. Uh, the R01 was funded. Um, we did modify the, uh, the 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 program just a bit. We now have a two-year follow-up, um, and we altered the control based on participant um, feedback. Um, we are looking at uh, slightly different, uh, the same outcomes, but we've added more in terms of biomarkers. We're looking at anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory cytokines. We're looking at physiological functioning. We're looking at social support. Uh, and social isolation, and we're looking at activity levels through Fitbit. Um, and then um, I, am, based off the success of the OLA HIV study, I then uh, got a supplement uh, through NIH uh, to look at OLA 
and trying to prevent cognitive decline in uh, older Latinos living with HIV. Uh, HIV-associated neurological disorder is uh, uh, neurocognitive, no, uh, neurocognitive decline um, is very prevalent. Um, and so uh, we're looking to see if, could we get, could we engage these folks in, uh, in uh, physical activity and in health promotion? And could we see that, um, could we see a difference or at least see some movement in there? And then um, hopefully in the fall, fingers crossed, we're work I'm working with uh, Kim and Caroline to see if we can uh, use Ola as a, as a social connection tool uh, in order a lot long term to prevent uh, suicide. And with that, it, I am done. Um, and I'll open up the questions. Uh, I'll open up the floor to questions and remember uh, to use the Q&A. Uh, forum to ask me any questions, and I'd be willing and more than happy to answer any and all questions. Excellent. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Jimenez. There are a number of questions here, so we'll, we'll try to work our way through them. Um, probably maybe if you bring down your slides, uh, oh. <clears throat> we can go from there. Sure. Um, first, there's a question from Kim Van Orden, actually, and she thanks you for an excellent presentation. We all echo that. Do you have uh, <clears throat> data on frequency of uh, completing social activities from the pleasant activities scheduling and data on frequency of continuing walks on their own after groups uh, have ended? I'm thinking about identifying active ingredients. So that's those are really good points. And so we do not have that. Um, so let me take a step back. We don't have the, we don't have data per se on the, um, on the pleasant events, if they complete it or not, what they, what the, what they do, what the, what the community health worker does is when talking about the, and talking about pleasant events, the, and I should have said this, the pleasant events are to be done, yes, with, the, with another person, but in the time it, and in between, the, uh, to be done before the next walking session. And so with, when the promotora engages the person in a pleasant event scheduling, again, they, she does mark down, you know, what they were going to do and then, and then asks them, oh, did you do that? Did you do, uh, you, you said you were going to, you know, Talk to your talk to your granddaughter. Did you end up doing that? And then no, why not? What was the issue? That, and so you know, there's a bit of um, there's a bit of problem solving almost, but uh, but we do address that. But we don't we don't we don't write that down formally, or it's not data that we have collected per se. Um, and then in terms of the uh, the the walking, um, what we're we didn't do that for the pilot. Um, but what we've done subsequently, or and we didn't do it for any of the pilots, uh, but what we've done subsequently, both in, uh, in the R01 and also in the supplement, we're doing is that we've given them Fitbits. And so that is data that we are collecting in terms of like, are they continuing with the walks or are they continuing being physically active after like outside of the walks? But, you know, once the, once the program is done, they keep the Fitbit, but we're not going to be monitoring them anymore, right? Um, so... Uh, so, yeah, that, I hope that answers your question, Tim. Yeah, thanks. There's a related one here uh, related to the question of active ingredients. <clears throat> There's a lot of potentially active elements to this. You call it a multi-component intervention. There's the, the social connectedness. There's the physical activity itself, which we know can be related to depression uh, treatment um, and then the pleasant activities scheduling itself, also an intervention for depression. Thoughts on on how you tease those apart, or whether whether you even need to. So, that's a good question. Um, and so, one of the things that, and that this is a this has been a critique that I've heard um, and I've received uh, since the since the beginning, since even the K award. And um, one of the things that we tried to do was to try to address that in the sense that um, we, hearing this feedback, we went back to the participants at, in, the, uh, in the original pilot trial. And we asked them like, 
was there a component that you liked better? What if we were to separate it? Would that work for you? Like, you know, one group, like if let's say you were randomized to just doing the the walk and then do the walk by itself, let's say, or you know, or social something social, or and and, and then the feedback was overwhelming that it was everything. What, what the participants really wanted was everything. It wasn't just the walking, although the walking was important and the walk and you know, they would say like, oh, my doctor wants me to walk more and this, this gave me the opportunity to do so. And, but the walk was important and being socially active was important too, but it was everything together. And then the, and then the, the pleasant events, well, it, what, what it allowed them to do is that it allowed them to carry the it's sort of like it, 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 it allowed them to apply what they were learning or what they were doing in, let's say, in this group walk into their daily lives. So this was something that was part of their lives, even when they weren't walking so or with us. So it, it became very clear to us that scientifically, yes, it would be a very interesting it would be a very interesting question to see, to ask, you know, what would happen if we did separate it? And is there like, and there, and that's definitely valid, but from a, from a participant point of view, that's not what's really interesting. That's not, you know, that, that's not important. What's important is that this is all together and this is what matters. And this is what really helped them get to where they wanted to go. Hmm. So there, there's a sort of disconnect between academic academia in terms of the science and then you know what's actually happening on the ground yeah and and some of that is certainly culturally determined i'm sure right um there's another question from caroline silva here do you have a sense of what the average or minimum number of weeks that might be um helpful or most acceptable to participants uh, out of the total possible 16 weeks uh, i know you presented the average sessions attended but i'm uh, curious if la promotora or the participants had reflections on the length, how many, how long it might take to establish the connections with others in the walking group to make it helpful. Yeah, and so that's actually something that I was really interested in. Um, it, again, I didn't realize that. To, I didn't realize how important or how interesting that question would be until we, are, we had already done the or after we had, or during the pilot. So as part of, the, as part of the the, um, the design of the R01, we are doing that. We're measuring them throughout. So I think we're measuring them at four weeks, at eight weeks, at twelve weeks, and at sixteen weeks. Not the full battery, but just looking at very specifically, um, uh, very specifically looking at depression and anxiety symptoms, and seeing where where are we seeing that change. Is that at four weeks? Is that at eight weeks? Is it at 12? And so looking to see, could we shorten it from 16 weeks? Could we shorten it to 12 or could we shorten it to eight? Great. Let's try to get one more in here before we need to stop. <clears throat> uh, someone asks about intergenerational uh, interventions and connections. Um, this is a, a peer support intervention ultimately, but do you see a role uh, in this culture and in this group for intergenerational um, activities? Oh, very much so. Um, and one of the things that I think would be interesting, and um, there was a student in the public in the school of in the Department of Public Health um, whose dissertation I was I, I, I was a part of, um, that she was looking at not necessarily OLA, but looking at could she develop a, a health promotion intervention where where it was grandparents and grandchildren. Uh, uh, basically like exercising or I, I, I can't remember if it was exercising or if it was nutrition, but it was, to, it's something along those lines. And I think it would be a, I think it would be a, I think it would be a fantastic uh, study to look at, could we do something very similar? Uh, could we use OLAC and then with, you know, the, the, the multi-generation, whether it's a child and a grand, and whether it's a child and parent or grandchild, and grandparent, because um, you know it, the Latino community is very tight knit. They tend to be very tight knit, um, with intergenerational support being a very large factor. And so, um, you know, to do something along those lines, I think would be a really, really interesting um, sort of uh, you know 
uh, twist on Ola as well. Excellent. Well, we're out of time, I'm afraid, so we're going to need to stop. Remind everybody to please uh, look for a way to fill out the evaluation form and uh, send you, Danny, off into the into the sun um, <laughs> to uh, for the rest of your day and everyone else off uh, elsewhere. I want to thank you once again for joining us here and look forward to another opportunity to, to see you here in Rochester in person. Really yeah, I can't. I'd, I'd love to be. A, I'd love to actually be there in person one day. We'll look for the for the opportunity. All okay, right. we'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye.